How's it going? Welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a 5th edition module. In today's video, we'll be going over the Land of Yawn, the general overview. Of course, there is going to be a ton of spoilers, so players do not watch this. But DMs don't want that added insight. Go ahead and stick around, because there is a lot to cover here. So here it is, the Land of Yawn. First biome we get into in the Land of Prismere is a swamp, the second being a forest, the third being mountainous. This is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most treacherous of all of them, because... Let's face it, at this point, your players are higher level because if you're doing the milestone approach, then for sure, they're going to be the higher level things here. And there's a lot more dangerous stuff going on. The thing to consider is, how do your players approach getting to Yawn in the first place? As written, your players get guidance from Squirt the Oil Can to navigate the clouds and make their way to Yawn. But do they go on foot? Do they go by way of balloon? Do they somehow hop a ride on some sort of flying creature in the land of Thither? And also very importantly is, do you need Squirt to be the one to guide your players there? It doesn't need to be, especially if your players do some sort of event where they soft lock themselves out and the Squirt either doesn't like them anymore or your players just can't get to the oil. You need to have someone that's willing to be a guide to get your players to the land of Yawn. What I will say though is if your players do come here by flying apparatus, then as soon as they cross into Yawn, they should be grounded immediately because this air is treacherous. It's cloudy overhead, there's rain and wind, and most important of all, lightning. So if they are by balloon or some sort of flying creature, they need to hop on ground and start hoofing it. And speaking of some of those fun features, let's talk about that and the features of Yawn. We've got these lightning rods. On the map there, you can see them, but once again, those features are not to scale. These lightning rods are pretty massive though. They're 30 feet tall and they strike with lightning and they start arcing all throughout the land of Yawn. That actually would be a pretty dope seeing all this lightning arcing across all these mountains, albeit it would be terrifying. The interesting thing here is there is a whole little paragraph dedicated to your players destroying these objects. So if your players really wanted to, they could absolutely go and destroy all the lightning rods, but are they going to get something out of it? Well, we'll check that out at Motherhorn. Another interesting feature about the land of Yawn is that there is a whole bunch of shadowless creatures. And that is because the owner and ruler of this location, Endolin Moongrave, happens to steal a lot of people's shadows. So your players should become more apparent as they meet with all these people that they are shadowless people. And that does in fact mean that they could be going up against a lot of shadow enemies later on. Which could prove pretty dangerous really. Especially if you have a melee based party and a whole bunch of people are getting the strength drained. That's actually a pretty big deal. Marvel or not, those strength doesn't get used that much, so whatever. The real thing to consider here, though, is creatures native to Prismere will not trust or do business with known shadowless creatures or those who ally themselves with one. So there seems to be a huge prejudice against people that are shadowless. And you can really play into that a lot. You can definitely have a lot of crazy little roleplay scenarios with that. But I do think that that could prove pretty disruptive, especially if your players ally themselves with some of these shadowless creatures, or they themselves get a shadow stolen from them. You know, it really comes down to how hard you want to play into that. Now, once your players have broken through the fog and arrive in Yawn, you actually get a nice little text blurb on what to say, and you, they can see the distant castle of Motherhorn. But before they get to Motherhorn, I would strongly suggest that you steer them into another direction of going to those named locations because those named locations are actually a lot of fun and are very informative of what's to come. If your players just head on straight to Motherhorn, then there might be some information that's lost and more importantly, there might be some backup that they don't have. What's also very interesting about this location is unlike the other two locations, we meet up with the guide that takes us to the next part of this adventure immediately. Amador and Gleam are found right here. It states here that this encounter should take place before the characters have their first random encounter or reach any of the marked locations in the Land of Yawn. I don't know how to feel about pushing the guide too early because I think that there should be a nice little theme between the three. But what I would say is there is definitely a lot of information to be gleamed from both Amador and Gleam. So if you have those people immediately right there, then you might lose out on some of the mystery that's going on around here. It really just comes down to how you feel about it, and also very importantly is how you feel about all the NPCs. Because at this point in the adventure, your players could have picked up a lot of named NPCs along the way. As my players are going through the land of Yawn right now, they have, I think, seven or eight NPCs that are following them in their wake. So you could definitely see how having more and more of these characters following suit 
it is going to add up quite a lot, especially if Amador and Gleam show up because Amador also comes with Paul and Ella. So take into consideration how you're pacing out the guides and all the other NPCs that join your party. So in regards of meeting with Amador and Gleam, as your players look around, they are approached by these two individuals. And there they'll be able to see that Gleam has no shadow because the thing about this land is as lightning arcs, you can definitely see who's got a shadow and who doesn't. As your players start talking to Amador and Gleam, they will learn that Amador the Dandelion ran off with Paulinella and they ran away from a Cyclops beekeeper. And the two of them cross paths with Gleam, who is got a sad story of her own. And Lynn Moongrave snipped off Gleam's shadow and also has Gleam's twin sister. And why is that? The reason why the hag has separated the two is because this hag's weakness is that she believes that her undoing will be done on an eclipse. And that's not just a physical eclipse, that could be a manifestation of an eclipse. And it just so happens that Gleam and her sister Glister both have an act where one of them dresses like the sun and one of them dresses like the moon. And thus symbolically, that is an eclipse and the hag doesn't want any part of that. Also some good tidbits of information your players learn is that Gleam is gonna tell your party, yeah, in the mountains there are these chords, they're stout fake creatures. Oh, and there's also an elf prince named Algarthus who made a bargain and is now basically trapped in this land. And Hurley the bugbear, who your players may know full well the brother of Burley, is also at Motherhorn as well. So your players can get a overload of information once again right as they approach this area. I always think it's good to try and dole out information over a longer period of time than just having an information overload. But if you've got players that love getting a whole bunch of options and a whole bunch of info right away, then power to you. So Amador the Dandelion is a kind, caring, chivalric individual. While yes, he does want to free the land of the terrible hags and guide the players to the Palace of Arts Desires, Amador must first help out Gleam because Gleam's plight is immediately right there and Amador has already said that they're going to help. And what's also really cute here is, in addition to serving as the character's guides in Yawn, Amador acts as the de facto leader for the company of guides, which at this point might include Clapperclaw and Squirt. Which I really like, I think it's really cute, especially if you have got more and more of these NPCs behind you, then definitely having the de facto leader take charge is a great way to go. It also does get some good tidbits here of information about if you've got a large NPC retinue behind your players, then have them do things that don't overshadow the party and also don't take up time. Have them take the help action, have them take the dodge action, or just not have them in combat at all. I personally love giving my players hirelings, henchmen, retainers, followers, mercenaries, because that makes the players feel awesome that whenever they turn around, they see that they've got a whole bunch of friends alongside them that are willing to join in along their adventures. But at the same time, you need to not take the spotlight away from the players. You need to make them the ones that shine. So now on to the random encounters in Yawn. So the random encounters in Yawn are actually pretty well throughout, but some of them might prove pretty scary. So let's start diving into those. The first random encounter we have is the Astronomer's Throne. The characters come across a throne hewn from a boulder and etched with astronomical symbols. If your players look at it, they can see an elvish inscription that reads out, I am a traveler from a distant land. My name is Mazikoth, Keeper of Stars. Sit on my throne, Disciple and unravel. So this one's really dope. This one definitely rewards players that are willing to be courageous in this because if they look and they don't know what's going on, then they're gonna have to sit there and do it. Your players could make a DC 20 Arcana or History check to recall that Mazikoth is an elf who is a celebrated astronomer who claims to hail from Black Star at the edge of night, which implies that if they are from the material plane, then they're from outer space. So any creature that sits here for one minute then falls into a magical trance that lasts for one hour. While in that trance, they begin to dream of being hurtled deep into space, far away toward a dead star. At the end of the dream, the creature arrives to the star's cold surface and awakes with a start, having inherited a fragment of Mazikos Psyche. The creature gains proficiency in the following skills, its choice. Arcana, Deception, History, Insight, Intimidation, or Survival. So that's your choice, you basically lay these out and say, hey, you can pick any of the proficiencies in any of these. In the very, very off chance that someone actually has all of these proficiencies, then maybe you give them something else, or maybe you allow that to be bumped up to expertise if you're so willing. It's not very likely that someone's going to have proficiency in all of these, but it could possibly happen. And of course, after your players have been told this information after this one PC gets it, then they're probably going to try and do some more. But once this happens, the throne is going to cease to be magical for a year, and that's that end of story.
So I really like this one. This definitely leads up to further adventures. You could definitely have some more details fleshed out about who Mazakoth is and where they came from and what's going on because Mazakoth is from some far distant realm. So who the heck knows what they're doing? Next up, we have the Awakened Giant Goats. The characters come across three giant goats. And the interesting thing is these ones are awakened. But in addition to that, they have silvery gray fur, wizened faces, and golden hourglass shaped pupils to observe the party. Which I think hourglass eyes would actually look a lot cooler and less creepy than normal goat eyes because normal goat eyes are demonic. Once they've gotten the party's attention, the goats will bleed out. When the moon obstructs the sun, Creeping Lynn will come undone. The second goat says, play to her passion, stay on script, a cat a horn or a shadow ripped. And the third goat says, the fool scepter is the key. So these things are monumentally huge. If your players come across this random encounter, they get some really juicy details. If they get this info before they go to Motherhorn, then boom, they are going to be set if they apply this information wisely. This helps telling your party about her weakness. This helps tell your party about what she's doing. And this tells your party about the scepter that belongs to Stage Fright. Very, very powerful stuff. But the thing is, nothing in this world is free. After speaking these words, the goats wait to see if the characters offer them something in return thereby honoring the rule of reciprocity. If your players do not do anything because they're absolute scumbags, then the goats are going to dip and a Galeb Dur is going to erupt from the ground beneath them. This elemental will immediately attack the party and fight until destroyed. I definitely think that's totally fair, considering that at this stage in the game, your players should know all about the rules of reciprocity. If they get something powerful in return, such as these um, tips, then if they don't do anything in return, they don't feed the goats, they don't give the goats something in return, some sort of information, they don't do anything, then for sure they get attacked. Screw you players. Now there is the slight possibility here if the goats run away and the Gable Door attacks, then maybe your players try and chase down the goats and maybe they try and get some more info out of the goats if you've got a really bad party. I would say the goats probably wouldn't try and give in anymore, or maybe the goats simply say, hey, that's all we know, that's the only thing we've heard, and baby, hopefully your players don't end these poor goats' miserable lives. Next up, we have Cyclops Beekeeper. A Cyclops Beekeeper named Mudlump stumbles across the party, and when he does, he looks at the party and immediately sees the missing queen bee. Amador, of course, is protecting Paulinella. And this Cyclops Beekeeper wants his Queen Bee back. So if this event happens before your players actually meet with Amador and Paulinella, then this could be a great foreshadowing of, oh hey, maybe we should be on the lookout for this missing bee. But if this happens after your players have met Amador and Amador is traveling with the party, then it's definitely going to come to a confrontation. Paulinella doesn't want to go back, so things are at a bit of a standstill. I've said this multiple times now, but I definitely think that everything in the land of Prismir should speak the same language just to make things a lot more inclusive and fun for everybody because the Cyclops screams out in giant, you stole Queen Bee, Mudlump needs Queen to make honey mead, best mead in yawn. And if you only have a few people respond to that and Amador doesn't know what's going on, then it's kind of lame. So just have everything be on the table and let the hilariousness ensue. So like all encounters in this adventure, there is of course a way to get out of this without combat. Your players could say, hey, 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 let's, uh, let's slow down there. Maybe we can work something out. One of the ways your players could get over this is by combat, but not a flat out regular combat, but by an honorable duel. Your characters can convince Mudlump to participate in an honorable duel against the, the one of their own. And that is a straight up 1v1. The unfortunate part about a 1v1 is against the Cyclops, that's pretty freaking tough. But I am willing to bet that there is some PCs out there that may have the absolute power build in order to beat Mudlump at this level. Not very likely, but definitely doable. Another option your players have is Magical Deception. Your players could try and fool Mudlump using some sort of magic and maybe giving them a fake. Or maybe disguising Paulinella so it doesn't look like the Queen Bee. Or your players could absolutely convince him saying, oh yeah, Paulinella doesn't want to go. I definitely see that approach working out well. And the third one, and honestly the most fun one here, is explain love to Mudlump. The characters tell Mudlump that Amador and Paulinella are in love. The statement causes the Cyclops to blink and ask, what is love? And if your players explain the concept of love, Mudlump declares that he'd like to be in love too and gives the characters a quest to find his true love. That true love is found in the Palace of Heart's Desires. 
and right there, that's an amazing hook to get your players to go there, and it's an excuse to have Mudlump go outside the Palace of Hearts Desires. You know, just a lot of fun things there. Thankfully for me, my players have gone down the love approach with Mudlump, and that is just an absolute delightful time. The interesting thing about this encounter is if your players interact with Mudlump and follow him back home, then they will discover the location that he lives in, basically like a little mushroom thing in the middle of the mountainside, and your players can look around and see what's being all grown here, and if they so choose to, they can loot the place, and there is actually a decent amount of gold worth of items here, and also a quiver of Aelona. Pretty dope. So the honorable duel is pretty straightforward, but your players may get absolutely creative and ham wild with it. Maybe they try and cheat, maybe they do something. And if it's caught and it's completely unhonorable, then the Cyclops is going to let loose. The interesting thing is, it doesn't say it's specifically on the character sheet and it does get lost in the text here, but the Cyclops Beekeeper here can use an action to summon forth a swarm of insects, which are wasps, and they can do this three times a day. This Cyclops Beekeeper has a whole bunch of wasp minions to help attack. You know, that's really cool. The second thing here, the Magical Deception, there is so many different ways your players could approach that depending on what spells they have, depending on how creative they are, depending on the circumstances. Your players could do a lot of things. They could try to convince Mudlump, they can try and, you know, make sure that Paulinella definitely is saying, hey, I don't want to return. There is so many ways to approach that, so just work with whatever they got, and if they got something creative, then go for it. The loved one, the loved one for sure, what I would recommend is if your players go down to the route of, hey, we need to find love for Mudlump, then we need to know that Mudlump needs a creature that is extremely large as well. And maybe you could have Amador say, oh, I do recall seeing a large creature head over to the Palace of Our Desires, and maybe we can find the true love there. I think that's an excellent way to definitely feel future adventure. Next up, we have the Evil Kite. As your players look around, they see a little goblin who is carrying around a kite, but they look absolutely miserable. As your players approach, the goblin will say, My arms are so very sore, I don't want to fly this kite anymore. But if I let go of the string, Creeping Lin says, I'll become an old thing. The curse comes for those five blue bows, but they won't come off while the wind blows. So right there, your players know the objective. There's this kid, and she's got a kite, and the kite has a whole bunch of ribbons on it. And if she lets go, then boom, she's going to get aged up 50 years. That would really suck. So what is causing this kite to fly? Well, it's actually caused by the poor goblin's mood. This kite is actually calling out and taunting the goblin and making her feel miserable. And that miserableness is causing a wind to billow up. So, your players need to get creative here, they need to think of something if they want to save her from a terrible, terrible thing of causing her to age. Your players need to either calm her down, or maybe create a, some sort of silence. They need to do something. I think that some people may try and do the thing of, oh, let's just shoot the ribbons off, because that's what players do. If that does happen, then there is a pretty bad thing that could potentially happen. So on the route of trying to calm her emotions, there is the spell calm emotions, there is a silence spell, there is a ton of other spells that could totally come in handy. These could be some sort of illusion spells to try and, you know, present to her a better little future here. This could be your players putting on some sort of performance. This could be your players all talking the little girl into feeling better about herself. This could be a number of things. Reward that creativity, and as long as they explain something totally awesome and it sounds reasonable, then it should be working, right? On the subject of your players shooting at the kite because they say, oh yeah, let's just shoot it down. What's the worst that could happen? If they shoot at it and they do not reduce it to zero HP in a single hit, it uses its reaction to yank the string from Fenia's grasp and it causes her to age really, really bad. As a reminder for the stats, because unfortunately they didn't put it in the actual book, it has an AC of 16 and 25 hit points. So unless they do 25 HP in a single shot, then this thing is unfortunately going to age her. So the real question is, is do you inform your players, hey, if you shoot this thing down, then it could prove disastrous or not? I would probably lean on the side of saying, yeah, maybe if you shoot it, there is a chance that the force actually pulls it out of her hand. That's what I would go about saying, because if you go down immediately saying, oh yeah, if you shoot it and you don't kill it in one hit, then they're probably just going to use their biggest thing ever and try and knock it down, when normally they wouldn't do that, right? So hopefully your players err on the side of creativity and not just boring, I shoot things. 
And if they do so, then this little goblin girl won't have to be aged up. But if your players fail in that regard, then this goblin is now going to be ancient, and that totally sucks. Regardless of how the encounter plays out, Fenia is not happy about having to return a Motherhorn because Creeping Lynn is there. She will tell the party, yeah, I know there's a small cave around here. I'm just going to chill in there, and I'm going to live off mushrooms for a while. Should your players help in her endeavor and not age her up, then your players will earn a trinket as a reward, which of course is gold in this world. But if your players have her aged up, then that totally sucks. No trinket for them. And that also might lead to some very angry parents later on. Next up, we have Goblin Procession. As your players are walking around there, they see a procession of goblins. And they look like they are a funeral procession. As your players begin to interact with these goblins, they figure out that these goblins, known as the Dead Ringers, are able to summon forth the spirits of Fey Dead and are able to ask them questions. They are willing to trade their services for a trinket, so if your players offer up a trinket, then boom, the goblins can summon forth several spirits after a minute and cast Speak with Dead, and that'll give your players three questions to ask the dead. And these could be anything, but the thing to consider would be what would these random ghosts know? Well, that's up for you to decide. Are these the ghosts of people that are super special, or are these just everyday commoners that would just know everyday things? For them, anyway. You know, I would say that you should have them be people that know something, and you could have these face spirits offer up some cryptic advice about some future encounter your players are going to get into. Your players may decide to get a little greedy with this and say, hey, let's get a whole bunch of questions done, and if they've got the trinkets for it, then let them. But after performing the ritual three times, the goblins must finish a long rest before they can cast the spell again. I really like this one. I definitely think that the dead ringers around here are a pretty special thing. And what I would strongly suggest is not have the spirits lie, not have the spirits say anything untruthful. Maybe have the spirits say something cryptic, or if they simply do not know the information about something, then just simply say, I don't know. But, you know... That would be kind of lame if you got a whole bunch of questions answered and all of them were lies because, you know, that would really suck. Next up, Goblin Shadows. As your players are walking around, your players may not spot anything because unless your players have a passive perception of 16 or higher, then they're going to get stalked by two shadows. These two shadows are essentially going to stalk the party, making spooky noises and threatening gestures, but otherwise cause no harm. If these shadows are attacked, then they're going to attack in return. And if one of these shadows is destroyed, then the other one flees. As always with these things, these shadows do not outright kill if someone's strength is reduced down to 0 HP. It's just that they get knocked unconscious, which I think is a pretty fair way to go about it. Now with this one, you can definitely have a lot of fun, especially if you've got nobody that's got a passive perception that's high. You could definitely have these shadows be looming around these corners that your players can't see. You can have these shadows be stalking the party and just causing them an absolute ton of commotion. Maybe this even plagues them further on, and maybe if your players go to any of the named locations, then these shadows are going to join in on some potential fight. Having shadows looming around, causing a whole bunch of spooky stuff to go down, it can be a ton of fun, especially if your players go to a location and you say that, oh yeah, a pebble kind of falls over, and oh, over there you see something rustling in the wind but there is no wind at this current moment you could definitely have a lot of fun with that next up we got pageant wagon as your players are marching around then boom a wagon appears in front of them as the wagon stops near the characters the curtain pulls back to reveal a painted backdrop and there your players will see a play being played out but the interesting thing is this isn't just any normal play this is a play of your party. In fact, this is a reenactment of everything your players have done in the land of Yawn so far. Which means if you have this done immediately as soon as they enter Yawn, then it's going to be super boring. But if you have this happen later on as your players are marching around, then it's a fun little recap of what's going on. But the interesting thing is, as your players are watching this for a few minutes, then boom, it's going to end where your players are at right now. They're going to see a little pageant wagon march up to the party, and a banner is going to draw forth and say, to be continued. I think that's so great. That's totally creepy it's totally fun it's totally whimsical it's a lot of fun things and you can definitely lean in toward any which way you can have it be dramatic you can be have it scary funny whatever it is that's a ton of fun the hooded figure that is part of this whole production is going to present forth tickets for the party written under the effigy your players can read out good for one private audience with end of the moon grave and no strings attached after the invitations are handed out the wagon and its attendants up disappear abruptly 
But the thing is, is if your players decide to try and finagle or mess up this thing, then the wagon's gonna absolutely collapse. So I totally dig this. Once again, I do think that this is better if you've had several encounters in land of Yon, because otherwise it's totally lame. One thing you could do is, you could have this be an entire reenactment of everything they've done in the land of Prismere. You could have it be as soon as the hags have learned of the party, then all of that info. You could have the play be a number of different things. It doesn't have to just be yawn. But I do think that no matter what it is, you should have it be totally fun and enjoyable for the party. And last but certainly not least for random encounters, we have Tornado. All of a sudden, everyone in the party must make a DC 17 strength saving throw. If at least half the party members succeed on the saving throw, none of them are swept away by the tornado. But if less than half succeed on the saving throw, then the entirety of the group is swept up, and each party member takes 3d6 force damage and is then thrown about the land of Prismere. What's also really cute is in addition to that, any character who fails the saving throw by 5 or more loses one non-magical item, and that's determined by you. The item should be something that could be reasonably snatched away in the wind, such as a belt patch or a helmet, etc, etc. These items are non-recoverable, they just straight up disappear. So the thing is, is after that, then you roll a d8 to determine where the party arrives. And this could be in hither, thither, it could be in yon, it could be all over the place. It could actually be in the Palace of Our Desires as well. So this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most disruptive random encounter in the entirety of this adventure. This one right here can easily throw off the entirety of your game. And most important of all, your player's game. So the thing to consider is, it specifically states the entirety of the party, that is both the PCs and the NPCs. Now, if you have it just be the PCs, then that still might be bad, considering that a lot of PCs don't take strength these days. But more importantly is the fact that there's a lot of NPCs your players could be picking up in this adventure. As mentioned before, my group's got eight. And that could, in fact, be a whole bunch of weak NPCs because, let's face it, there's a lot of NPCs in this venture that are physically weak. So that would feel kind of bad for me, personally, if it was the four PCs and they all succeeded, but then all of the NPCs failed. That would be kind of lame, if you ask me. So maybe you do just dial it back down to saying it's just flat out the PCs and the NPCs either succeed or fail with the group. I think that's a fair way to go about it. Regardless, though... No matter what the outcome is here, you have to live with the ramifications. Because if all of a sudden your players are in the middle of yawn and boom, they get sent to hither. Or boom, they get sent to thither. Then you're going to have to work with that, right? The ones that take your players through yawn, I think are a lot more fair. Especially if you have these random encounters done immediately after they leave the Brigand Mock Mine, for example. And they just get flown right back. That's not that bad. But what is bad is if your players are on their way to Motherhorn. And then, boom, all of a sudden, they appear right there in Hither. That could really suck, depending on where they're trying to go, what they're trying to do. One of the absolute showstoppers here is, of course, if your players land in the Palace of Hearts Desires. Right there, boom, they are speedrunning this adventure and going straight to the end game. I both like and dislike this random encounter. It certainly could lead to a lot of fun, but I could certainly see how it could be very disruptive to the kind of game that you're running. And most important of all, if your players lose some sort of item or something like that, I could definitely see that. And also very important is the fact that it is a DC 17 strength saving throw. Even if you have, let's say, like a plus 2 to it and you're not proficient in it, you're going to suck, right? That's just the way it is. It's more than likely that groups are going to fail this. More than likely. And, you know, unfortunately that is just how it is written. So maybe you could slash down the DC if you wanted to. Maybe you could say if they take some sort of precaution, then you lower the DC down. Maybe do a number of things like that. I definitely think that this is certainly something that you should threaten your party with, especially saying, hey, this tornado looks like it's trying to yeet you out of this land right now. <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of fun. Regardless, though, if you do plan on running random encounters and you happen to have this one, then I say just let the dice fall where they land because that is honestly a great part about D&D is just rolling with the punches and the dice. The last thing I'll say, though, is if your players do land in the land of hither or thither, then I would say just have them land at one of the name locations because that just makes your life super simple. Alrighty, that's going to do it for the Land of Yond overview and random encounters. There is a lot of great things we had there with just your players interacting with this environment. Especially if your players have gotten used to normal climates such as swamps and forest. Mountains are typically ones that we don't normally see. So having mountains and lightning and you know wind and stuff like that, that's a ton of fun. 
the encounters your players can have is totally great, especially if your players pick up Amador and Gleam and just flesh out their NPC party more and more. Ton of great fun, a lot of great things there, and there's a lot of foreshadowing to come. In the next video, we'll be going over the name locations of the Land of Yawn, and then after that, we'll be diving into Endolin Moongrave and Motherhorn. So that's going to do it for me today. Go ahead and tell me, what do you think about Yawn? Do you think that Yawn stands out in the Land of Prismere, or do you think that this place is a little bit too drab for the rest of the delightful area of Prismere? How's your party looking at this point? Do you think your party is going to have a ton of NPCs with them? Or do you think that your party is going to rough it out with no NPCs in tow? And how do you feel about that tornado? Are you going to run it purely as written? Or are you going to just yeet that thing out the window? Go ahead and tell me those things because I love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.